are Joseph Prince. Praise God. So I just pray that they, the North Korean, leader of North Korea, and also our president, they might even meet in church. Who knows? So let's just praise God for it all, right? Let's go before him in prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you today once again that we had the privilege of lifting up the authorities that are over us. You tell us that we're to pray for kings and all those in authority over us, for we shall be people living quiet and peaceable lives. So we just trust you, God. You're the one who rules over all. And we realize that this day has been a marvelous day thus far. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We see you glorifying the results of all things that we're facing. No matter what it is that we're going through, you have already given us the victory. So, Lord, we don't walk according to our circumstances. We walk, walk by faith. And the faith that we walk by is not our, our faith, it's your faith. For you tell us, even as Paul described, Lord, in Galatians 2.20, that I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it's not I that lives, it's Christ that lives within me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith, by the faith of the Son of God, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We realize you're the object of our faith. It's not the amount of our faith, it's the object of our faith. And you are the one who truly has given us your faith, given us your life, given us your righteousness, given us your wisdom. And to you, we give all the praise, honor, and glory. We trust you for our leadership, as we mentioned, our military throughout the entire world. Protect them, keep them. Not only, Father, them that are in uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, line of fire, but also, Father, for those who are having loved ones, those that are back home, worried about their, their son or their daughter or their husband or their wife, whatever it might be. And thank you, God, for the victories that have been won militarily throughout the entire world, even as we've celebrated recently on June the 6th, D-Day, Father, losing nearly 5,000 men as they went ashore to secure uh, that area of France. Father, we see you glorified in all things, and we thank you for it. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and all of God's children said, Amen and Amen. Praise be to the Lord, right? It is finished. This is what God was kind of putting in my brain this past week of time. It's been found in John, the 19th chapter. We're going to look at it, because what he says to me is, what part of it is finished do you not understand? E either we're new covenant people or we're not. Either your person is down because of the situations you're involved in or you're up because I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, greatly loved by my Creator. Amen? That's what we need to speak. Speak according to what God's Word says. And I understand that you know the message of the gospel which declares, yes, it sounds like it's almost too good to be true, but it is true, every bit of it. And I have people that are going through battles, and sometimes they don't understand the gospel. As I mentioned, very few do at times. And I'm not trying to say that a person that has received Jesus, that doesn't understand the gospel, is an unbeliever. Believe me, I don't want that confusion to be there. I want you to realize that you're just missing out on the gospel. Realize that there's growing in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ gives you a better understanding of the gospel. You see who you are because you're in Him and He's in you. Amen? That's what God declares to all of us. So when I see people that are going through battles, going through trials in life, and I want to encourage them, and maybe they bring up, well, what does it mean by plead the blood? Or maybe they might say plead the blood. I've encouraged them to say, this isn't a begging situation. You're not going into a court of law begging for mercy. You've received mercy. You're not begging for favor. You've received favor. You're not begging for a non-guilty status. The Bible says you're justified. You're no longer guilty. So I want you to realize, and all people to realize, that when you're in a court of law using this verbiage in a court of law, and you might say in your prayer or in your declaration to God that you're only declaring something that he's already decreed. And that is my plea. I know I've stood before a judge before and I had a, a parking ticket. I was actually in an area where I was outside of a, a shopping center and I was in a fire zone and I was sitting there in the vehicle with it running. He pulled up behind me. I didn't see him. I had two of my, one of my sons and his buddy was there, their cash register about to come out. So I felt, I don't need to move. I, I couldn't see the police officer behind me. Came up behind the side of me and gave me a ticket. Uh, you're in a, a no parking zone. Went before the judge and he says, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? I said, I'm guilty, but let me explain. Okay. And that's what we can all say to court law. You know what? We're guilty, but let me explain. Okay. I was guilty as charged, but now I plead the blood of Jesus that declares that I'm not guilty. Why? Because all my blame is passed over on my Savior, Jesus Christ, who's received it. 
He's my advocate now. He's my judge. He's my savior. He set me free and set me free indeed. Amen. So you and I have something really good to talk about all the time. So when we're stuck in an airport for nine hours, we talk about Jesus. And when I talk to someone who's been preaching the word of God from Brooklyn to Atlanta, and I realize he doesn't understand the gospel, God said, that's why you're here. Talk about the gospel. Or another person that says, you know what? This has been the way I was raised. And I said to him, this is the gospel. All right, we talk about it. And then I get down there, like I said, with my friend, and we pray. Why? Because God says he establishes things upon this earth. He sets up. He sets down. He does whatsoever he will among the children of men. And God's the one that said, yep, you've been served for seven years or 12 years. You're going to serve for another six if the Lord tarries that long. The point being is that another situation took place. My wife and I were traveling back last week. It was on a Sunday, and we got up to uh, Interstate 85, just about the Virginia line. There's about 25 miles, 30 miles into construction. So we're shut down because we're in one lane with no place to go, and there's an accident ahead. And so we're there for an hour and a half. So instead of complaining about it, like it's so easy to do, got out of the vehicle, started walking up, saw a truck driver up there, and I said, okay, he might be able to give me some words. So I went up there and talked to him, and guess what? We talked about Jesus. Because he had the cross on the side of his truck. He had a cross here. But then when there was, there was some things to talk about, and it was the gospel. Let me explain to you the gospel. Because so many times you let people talk, and they start talking, and right away they rebuilt it. They don't understand the gospel, so you bring out the gospel. So then we finally broke loose from that traffic, and my wife said, I said, look, she said, it's about time for us to eat. I said, well, why don't we hit a Wawa? Yeah, that's good. I haven't hit a Wawa in a long time. Let's go up that way. So there was one that I thought of that I'd never stopped at before, but I worked in the area of Petersburg, Virginia, and I knew one was on Temple Avenue in Colonial Heights, so I went there. I pulled up to a pump, filled up with gas, went inside. We got our food. We were, I was going back in, so I moved the truck away from the pump because I wanted to get it away from there. And I started walking back to the store, and the guy says to me, he says, Gary Kelly. And I'm like, Gary Kelly? Yeah, Gary Kelly. Okay, so here's a guy that used to work for me that I hired years ago down in Waverly, Virginia that left our, our company, went to, with another company. He says, you know, I befriended you on Facebook. I said, yeah, I know. He said, there's some things that I want to talk to you about. It's about the Word of God. I need some understanding. He said, the only person I have to talk to is a guy at work. He's a Jehovah Witness, and he's telling me about these 144,000. I said, well, yeah, Keith, you and I need to talk. And so we started talking. He said, well, I went to church with my mother, and the pastor said, don't talk to Jehovah's Witness. I said, nothing wrong with talking to them. But you need to establish one thing first. Who is Jesus? Is he God or not? Because if you didn't get past that one, there ain't nothing to talk about. Because basically that is the era of any type of cultism. The first thing is Jesus isn't God. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal. And that's what you need to understand. So if you can't get past first base, don't even try to go to second, I said. If you have any questions about this, we'll be glad to talk to you about it. Why? Because that person needs salvation too. Just trying to tell you about 144,000. Wrapped up in something we don't need to worry about. Guess what? We're not going to be here anyway. So the whole point of it is, and then God said to me, let's just jump down here, Tara. I just want to jump down before I get into it. Uh, to the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, 35 through 39. Because real quick, it's the story of Philip and the eunuch. And Philip was directed by God to go into the presence of this eunuch and talk to him about salvation of Jesus Christ. But I want you to see this, because this is so essential. This is so necessary. What is there to preach about? What is there to talk about? The Lord just hit me with the word preach, okay? And he just dropped the P and said reach. And so the P is for the people. Reach the people, he said, by preaching Jesus Christ. And that's what it says here. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. What was it? Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, talking about Jesus Christ, his wonderful redemptive story. Now, I want you to see here that Philip took that scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Took an Old Testament scripture, preached unto him Jesus, because every single one of these scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, testify of Jesus Christ. Amen? Look at 36. He says this, and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? 37, and Philip said, If thou believest, with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son or Son of God. See, a lot of people say, Well, he's the Son of God. Well, understand this, that it's understood in that day because everybody knew here is the wonderful Kikios, Jesus Christ, who is Lord, the creator of all of it, he says, who's the son of the Father who came down here to the earth to give his life in your place and mine, says he is the son of God. 38, 
And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, but Philip and the eunuch, and he, and he, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, where's the miracle? A lot of times you focus on, he caught Philip up, took him out of the way, the eunuch saw him no more. That's the miracle. No, that's not the miracle. And that's what God hit me forcefully with last Sunday. He said, let me tell you, I put you here, and I put you there, and that third place I put you, and the fourth place I put you, and I want you to realize this, I'm doing the same thing today that I did in that day with Philip. And this isn't about catching somebody up and sticking someplace. I put you here, he says, whether you say you got here in a vehicle or you got here miraculously, I put you here for such a time as this to speak to that person about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what he does all of us. So God kind of like blew me away with that. Oh, my goodness. Lord, you're the one. There's no way, if I hadn't been stopped in traffic for an hour and a half, if I hadn't, I thought, chose this place to pull over to Wawa at this certain time to meet with this certain person. I can't do these things, but God does them. And he does them in your life and does them in my life. Why? Because he says the time is short. And what is the urgency? It is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, King and Lord God of all. Amen? So look what he says here as we start off our, our verse, our scriptures here. It's in John 19. It's about it is finished. And God telling me and telling the church, because let me tell you something, we have to go over these things all the time. I mean, I have people that are bouncing things off me. I'm bouncing things off of them. God gave me a revelation on Friday. I was driving home from Harrisburg. I thought I was having a heart attack. I think I just pulled a muscle in my chest or whatever. But the point was, I was driving. I was in pain. I was like, what's going on? And God just spoke to me about revelation of Jesus Christ and a couple of scriptures that bring fear into people's lives. So I'll talk about them here. We'll try to hit them. But my point is this. When we look at this, Christ is on the cross. Christ, God, perfect in every way. As I've mentioned so many times with C.S. Lewis, you have to settle one of the three L's. Jesus, he's, he's either Lord, or he's liar, or he's a lunatic. Because he said he's God. Lord is kokios in the Greek meaning creator God. Okay, all things were made by him, and without him, anything that you and I see, everything that we see was made by him. Nothing was made without him. So he says here, after this, Jesus, knowing that all, he says, things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. He says, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon his soup, and they put it to his mouth. So here he is saying, I thirst. Here he is receiving the hyssop, or actually upon the hyssop, this vinegar, these sour grapes, actually redeeming you and I from the curse of the law. For cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. For through the law is the knowledge of sin, and through the law is the strength of sin. Every single person that ever fell, fell because of the law. Well, they fell because of the terrible, simple nature, but the point is, they broke the law. So even prior to the law, in the case of Adam and Adam and Eve, we know that Adam rebelled against God. Eve was deceived, Adam rebelled. God, I'm not choosing you, I'm choosing Eve. He rebelled. When God says, even though that first commandment wasn't even in existence, we can say, well, thou shalt have no other gods before me, the very first commandment. And Adam transgressed against the commandments that weren't even in existence yet. So we realize without a law or, or actually established covenant or established law, there's no transgression of the law. So I'm just saying, hypothetically, there's a transgression of that law. He says here, and when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The next verse says this. I'm sorry, now let's stop at 30. Let's, let's slow down for a second and say what he said. When therefore Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now God is telling me today, he's telling you as well, it is finished. To tell us die, paid in full, everything, so why is it there still this deep, dark depression and guilt and anxiety that so many people are facing because we simply don't understand what it means by it is finished and it's found in the book of ezekiel here i want to show you this what took place in jesus his life ezekiel 18 1 to 4 because so many times people think well you know there's this generational curse upon my life understand this there's no generational curse upon your life why because you're under the new covenant of grace under the old covenant i will visit your iniquities upon he says one generation after another. Under the new covenant of grace, your sins and iniquities, I will remember, he says, no more. Amen? I will remember your sins no more. Your iniquities no more. 
They've been taken away completely. So he says this in the New Living Translation, the justice of a righteous God. Then another message came to me from the Lord. This is what Ezekiel is saying. 19, I'm sorry, 18 too. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. That's what Jesus did. He took the sour grapes upon his lips at the cross of Calvary, indicating not only have I taken away the curse from you, but I've taken the curse away from your children. He goes on to say this in the third verse, As surely as I live, says the Lord God, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. The fourth verse, For all the people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike, and this is my rule, the person who sins is the one who will die. Now, everybody was under that. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. But God brought forth His redemptive plan. Telling us in Isaiah 53, the sixth verse, All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to our own way. But God laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Amen? God laid upon Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all. The wages of our sin is death. Romans 6.23 But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus telling us at the cross of Calvary, I thirst. Why? So you will never thirst again. You're not thirsty because Jesus Christ has satisfied you and I with His wonderful, life-giving, eternal life, Holy Spirit power that He's placed upon your life and mine. Amen? That's what He's done for us. And it's time to shout, time to praise the Lord because He's done marvelous things and we shall live forever, the Bible says, with Him. And so I thank God for that. He's marvelous. He's wonderful. He's done some amazing things for us. But to realize what he did at the cross. So when he bowed his head and said it is finished. Not that he said someone took my life from me. No, I have the power to lay down my life and take it up again. He gave up the ghost, he says, after he says it is finished. And those words go on forever. Sound waves continue to go on forever. You and I speak that same word of God. It is finished. And so what is he saying? Paid in full. Paid in full. Paid in full. I plead the blood. Not guilty. I'm justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. In a court of law, it declares when I bring that forth as my decree, declaring something that's been decreed to me, I am not guilty of any sins, past, present, and future. Amen? I'm set free and I'm set free indeed. That's what God has done for me. Amen? Look at Lamentations 3 with me, please. Now, this person, the reason why I bring this up in the New Living Translation, I don't know if you have heard me talk about Bob George. Bob George wrote Classic Christianity. He was... Uh, a radio talk show host about people-to-people ministries for years of time. He passed away June 1st. And as I looked through uh, his obituary, this scripture came up, but it came up in the New Living Translation, not in the King James Version, not in so many other versions that I looked at. Because we talk about God's mercies being new every morning and great is His faithfulness. But the King James doesn't reflect upon the fact that God's love, he says, is new every morning. Like I mentioned in Songs of Solomon, the first chapter, the second verse, it says about God's love being as fine wine. It, we used to often mention, well, God loved me. As if it's in the past tense. There's no past tense in the Hebrew. God loves you. And that love is new every morning. That's what he says here. Look at this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. The faithful love of God never ends. It's an exceeding love, he says. It's an eternal love. It's a love, he says, without condition. He loves you with an everlasting love. He's hopelessly in love with you. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. They are new every single morning. So I don't want you to see mercies. I don't want you to see, just see faithfulness. I want you to also see the love of God. It's new every single morning. Amen? Look at Psalm 36 with me, please, 5 through 7. Because he calls, talks about this. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. You care for your people and animals alike, O Lord. And 7 says, How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of the wings. Amen? In the shadow of your wings. 
That's what God's magnificent love is all about. Jason was preaching on that this past Sunday uh, up in uh, Philadelphia about guarded by God's love. Dave was down here doing a great job. Praise God for the word that they both gave out. I was encouraged by both of them. I told my wife this morning, I said, Jason's on YouTube this morning. We're listening to his sermon on the way to church here this morning. But God is just doing some powerful things, and he's raising up a younger generation, I do believe, that understands things. I mean, they might question. You people have this tradition. You older church people, you have this tradition, but we want answers. Okay, we want to know the message of the gospel. Why? Because we've been hit by the Holy Spirit of power. He's the one letting us know that we're eternally loved, that we can't mess this thing up if we wanted to. We can't outrun His favor. We can't outrun His blessings. We can't outrun His love. He's the one that has an everlasting love upon you and I. Amen? That's what He's done. Praise be to God. Let's read here in our next scripture. It's found in the book of John in the 8th chapter. I want to jump over here to John, the 8th chapter. And you know this, this whole story about a woman taking an adultery. And Jesus says, oh, no, he hasn't gone to the cross, but it's finished. And so there's two hang-ups people have. Now, I want to tell you something. When we go through these two hang-ups, this is the way it works. Because I, have, I was under a situation where if you had something terrible happen in your life, you need to find out the reason. And boy, that sent me on a wild goose chase because I was so far off target with what may have been the reason that I, didn't, I couldn't even see straight. And I found out the reasons why there was difficulties at times is because I still put myself under the law even though God said it's finished. God said it's finished. God said it's been made complete. He said your sins and iniquities I remember no more. You've been given everlasting life, and my blessings upon you are not based upon your performance. My blessings upon you are based upon the fact that I love you with an eternal love. So many times we say, well, if I give, I can get. God says, no, that's the Old Testament. The New Testament is, you now have been, you've now received, therefore freely you've received, you freely give. You know, now I'm not looking for blessings. The blessings have come, and I'm just sharing the blessings. Whole different attitude. But God says, what's the problem with every single individual that's actually been entrapped in some difficulties as we bring them up here? It's all a violation of the law. And I want to show you that you're no longer under the law. You're no longer under the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law, for he was made a curse for you. For cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. And he's the one that took the taste of the sour grips, grapes upon his lips. So that the children, he says, would not suffer under, he says, even the things their parents have done. And the parents would no longer suffer as they turn to the new covenant of grace in Christ Jesus our Lord, realizing he's done it all. See, people talk about consequences all the time. Well, God will get you, God will get you. Believe me, that vertical relationship we have, God took care of all of it. He's not get you. He's not out. He's not hunting for you. He's already found you. Even though we say, well, I found Jesus. No, you didn't find Jesus. He wasn't lost. Okay? Jesus is the one that actually worked in your life in such a wonderful way, loving way, he can finally reveal himself to you and you say, oh, what a wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. See, I don't have to get up here and talk to you about, you know what, you need to drop this off out of your life. You need to drop this out of your life. I need to drop this out of my life. All I need to do is point you to Jesus and guess what? He does wonderful things and something dropped off and I didn't know when it dropped off. I got a new want to and didn't even know how I got a new want to. And I don't brag about my want to because it's his want to. He does things that are unbelievable. And so when we think, we, well, you know, I messed up, you know, and I feel all guilty and condemned about it, God said, that's not me. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not doing that. Because I always encourage, I lift up, I declare unto you my righteousness. So this woman was taking adultery. Right in the very act, the Bible says, brought her there. They were going to stone her to death. Jesus was the one saying, you know, kind of ignored him, wrote on the ground, stood up, said, he was without sin, let him cast the first stone, went back down and wrote on the ground. The fiery finger that burned the commandments in on Mount Sinai was the same fiery finger that was burning into sapphire right in front of them all saying, that's God. And every one of them walked away one by one from the eldest to the youngest. Every one away went, went away convicted of their own heart that I was guilty of the very same thing. Not just guilty of the sin. I'm guilty of the very same sin this woman committed. Same one. Have you ever seen that? This person's guilty, but you know what? I'm going to rise up in self-righteous. I'm going to condemn that sin in that person's life, and I'm guilty of the same sin. No. So after it all, 
The one that was guiltless and perfect, Jesus, could have picked up a stone and threw it, but did not. Why? Because he's the one that was perfect in every way. And on the other hand, the other one, he says, that was actually guilty, they couldn't pick up a stone. They couldn't throw a stone. Couldn't do anything wrong. They couldn't throw anything at her. Look at what he says here. After everybody left, Jesus says to the woman, do you, does anyone condemn you? She says, no one, sir. She said, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Now, I want you to think about this. See, so many times people, well, you know, okay, I can't get back into that ever again. I can't do this, can't do that. Please, Lord, help me not to do these things anymore. Wrong mentality. If you want to get back under the law, he's saying, you will get back under sin. Why? Because in the law, there's a strength of sin. And in the law, he says, there's a knowledge of sin. And I've come to redeem you, he says, from the curse of the law. For cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. I want you to understand this. In the case of this woman, in the case of the man that was paralyzed for 38 years, in both these cases, when he talked to them about going and sinning no more, he was telling them, don't go back under the law. You say, well, I don't know if I can handle that, Pastor. Well, let me get through with this. Because I want you to soak that in. Because so many times people say, okay, now I'm going to go forth with a greater determination. I'm going forth with more strength. I'm going to do this thing in my ability. I'm not going to fall again and... I fell again. And even if you and I sometimes think that we're righteous in every aspect, and saying that, which we are in Christ Jesus, believe me, in every aspect, but I'm talking about in self, so many times thinking, you know what, I got it all covered. You don't have it all covered, but Jesus Christ covered you in all things. For he tells us, as I bring up again, memorize this, Romans 6, 11, reckon yourself to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ my Lord. I'm dead to the old man, dead to the self-life. I'm alive in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, praise be unto God. Amen? So I want you to realize when someone, when Jesus is coming and saying, okay, go and sin no more, or in the case of the NIV here, because I look at all the translations, and Young's little translation does a pretty good job with it as well, says here, go now and leave your life of sin. The only way to do that is to be on the new covenant of grace. Because if you're under the law, which is the power of sin, you're going to fall back into it. So we don't understand that actually where is the sin? When he says go sin, don't go under the law anymore because the law, he says, shows, law is perfect. But when it flows through me, according to Romans 7, it says, it kills me. It brings out basically my former, if a person's unsafe, sinful nature. But now that I'm saved, I have the new nature in Christ Jesus. Be reminded of that. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, saved in Christ Jesus. Because too many times, people, as I mentioned to you before, start reading the book of John, and I said I got away from that because I'm going to Romans 5, 12 through 21, memorize those nine verses because they start reading. They come to this, oh, hopeless. Because you know what? I sinned, and he forgave me for it, and now he tells me to go do it, sin no more, and I sinned again, and I got to go ask him to forgive me for it. No, you don't ask him to forgive you for it. You thank him that he already forgave you for it. That's the work of the cross. We'll look at that in Ephesians 1.7 because so many times people memorize 1 John 1.9 and don't realize it's a contradiction in Ephesians 1.7 because he's talking to unbelievers in the first chapter and believers in the second chapter. That's a whole Bible study in itself. But I got set straight, I think years ago, by Bob George. Because when you start really teaching grace, you have to review everything now. All my past learning, all the different places where I was bound, I now have to review everything in the light of grace. And when you review it, view it in the light of grace, this neon sign comes up, these LED readouts. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know. Right? Amen? That's what he's done. Look at our next scripture up here, please, with me. Find it here in the book of John, the 8th chapter. We already went through this. Jump over to the next one. It's found in John 5. Look at 9 through 14. This is the man who was crippled. And immediately the man who was made whole took up his bed sorry, and walked, and on the same day was Sabbath. 38 years. I always play with numbers. Three, Holy Trinity. Eight, New Beginning. 38 years. What happened? Five porches, the grace. Here this man came in touch with who was actually grace when he actually entered into this area which calls Springs of Life. Springs of Bethesda. It's actually Springs of Life. Look at what he says in 10. He says, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is a Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. See, that's, that's the way so many people look. 
this guy's carrying his bed. We ain't going to talk about the fact that this man's healed. No, we ain't going to talk about it. Oh, don't, carry that, don't carry that bed. It's Sabbath day. You're in the law. Look at the 11th verse. And he answered them that had been made whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. So I did what he told me to do. 12th verse. Then asked him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? 13. And he said, unto, and he said that was healed, wist not that it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Next verse. He says this. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. Under thee. Now, Joseph Prince, this past week, because this is what I started meditating upon, said it's a specific sin. He said, basically, it's not sins. It was a specific sin. The one that you're involved in, don't do it anymore. I said, okay. I said, this goes further than that. Praise God. A lot of light, a lot of understanding, but it goes further than that. Because God had hit me on Friday evening with saying, what actually is the result of a person in violation to the law? The curse. Someone, he says, that has violated the, car, the law, there's a curse. Just read Deuteronomy 28. Jesus is saying this. You were under the curse of the law for transgressing against the law, but now that I've come, he says, as your Redeemer and, your Redeemer and Savior, don't go back under the law, lest a worse thing come upon you. So, my point is this. People say, okay, well, you know what? I actually got into this sin, and the result of that sin was this. And therefore, now that there was a result of that sin, I need to make sure I don't do that again. Don't you know you're up against a destroyer, Satan? He tries to rob, kill, and destroy. You think he cares if it's that sin or this sin that possibly an affliction was upon your life? And people so many times try to say it's because this affliction is the reason, I mean, because this sin of affliction was upon my life. That drives you crazy. That's totally false. That's not what takes place. What takes place is, are you under the law or in the old covenant or are you under grace in the new covenant? What part of this, it is finished, do you not understand? It's done. I've been redeemed. I don't live in fear. I don't say, well, you know what, this terrible consequence is a result of, of me doing something. No, I, and I realize, I'm, I'm just going to say this, people. I'll go ahead and admit there is horizontal consequences. I'll, I'll deal with that. People to people, horizontal consequences. But this vertical relationship, there is no vertical consequences. Because Jesus Christ says, the penalty of sin is death, and I took care of that. Amen. When people think sometimes something happened to me, and God is mad with me, and he struck, this, he struck me with this, total wrong thinking. And that's what Jesus is dealing with right here. Don't go back under the law. Because through the law is the knowledge of sin. Through the law, he says, is the strength of sin. You need to be delivered from the law. You need to be a person who realizes I fulfilled the law and now I've given you eternal righteousness in myself. And so don't get back under the law. Don't think if I do good, I get good. If I do bad, I get bad. I want to ask you something. When you were born, or even with Adam, every person that's a descendant of Adam realizes I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do what Adam did. But guess what? No matter how much good I do, I can't get myself out from under that Adamic nature until I receive Jesus Christ. Now, I'm in Christ. I'm righteous. What bad things do I do to get me out of this? You can't. Couldn't do enough good things to get me from the sin that I was in to the righteousness I needed. And I'm going to just tell you this. Can't do enough bad things to get me out of the righteousness that I'm in. I'm going to tell you right now, Christ, because he's in you, there's things that drop off. Don't focus on what I can do, what I better not do. As your eyes are on Jesus Christ, things happen, people. And it's lovely. It's lovely. It's wonderful. Let's conclude right now with Deuteronomy 28. I don't have, let's, let's look at Ephesians 1 7 real quick, and then I'll finish with Deuteronomy 28. I know that I'm running a little bit long, but I want you to get this down. People, if you want to memorize the scripture, please memorize the scripture. Don't, don't keep being bold. You know what? I did something wrong. I must confess my sins, so he's faithful and just forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That was the people who wasn't saved. You're saved here. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. According to what? According to the riches of His grace. Look at Deuteronomy 28 in closing, please. 28, 67, it says this. Through the 67, actually, 66 through 68. Now, 
We know the first 10 verses, all the blessings. After that, the cursings of disobedience. Christ is the one who's obeyed. I'm under all his blessings no matter what forever, never to change. I can shout hallelujah for that. And thy life shall hang in doubt. This is a part of the person under the curse. This is people that God says, go and sin no more. Don't get back under the law, he says. It's condemning. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have no none assurance of thy life. So here's constant fear, people anxiety, fear. How much is in the church today? Why? Because you're not understanding the gospel message under the new covenant of grace. These things are upon you. I don't have this anymore. Look at 67. In the morning thou shalt say, would God it were even? And at evening thou shalt say, would God it be morning? When it's night, I want it to be day. When it's day, I want it to be night. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Finally, he says here, and the Lord, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, here he is. The Lord God shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. So you were released from captivity. You're brought back to captivity. That's what happens with people mixed up between the law and grace. By the way, where, where, what, whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there it shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, he says, and no man shall buy you. Now, I've already talked to you about this before. No man shall buy you. Jesus bought you. Now that Jesus bought me, tells me it's finished, tells me everything that he has been given to me in Christ Jesus, I have no fear, I have no bondage, I have no reverse of the curse coming back upon me. I'm set free and I'm set free indeed. Amen? That's what God tells all of us. Praise be to God. What part of it we, do we not understand? God said, it is finished. Your telestai paid in full. Live free as a child of the Almighty God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Let's go before him in prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you again that we are children of the Most High God. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us in Christ Jesus. I praise you, Father, for the salvation that I have in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I thank you, God, that it is truly finished and that I am not under the law. I am under grace. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have been, it's been declared, Father, that I am not guilty I am justified. I realize I have the blessings of Almighty God upon me and in my family. For you tell us in your word, the promises are to you and to your children and to those that are far off. So I have to receive that in Jesus' name. I thank you for all of it, God, in the name of Jesus. Fully blessed, and I praise you fully, Lord. So I pray, Father, as part of the church, that we go out. Because you've already, in so many ways, anointed us to preach good tidings to the poor as Jesus Christ preached. To even heal the brokenhearted. Now, Father, I pray for one of our classmates right now. They lost her son, Lord, this past week, tragically. And, Father, I pray that you will comfort her heart. For you're the one who came to heal the brokenhearted. I praise you for that and give you glory for it, Lord. And thank you for all these things because I've asked them all in the name of Jesus and through his blood. And all of God's children said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get on our feet. Let's sing, He is Yahweh.